As the year draws to a close, one conclusion is inescapable. Government this year has been diabolical. We've had the fiasco of Rudd and Gillard and Rudd again. Profound disappointment in New South Wales. Harch is gone, the problems remain. Brad Hazard seems to think that some gigantic planning overhaul to accommodate someone yet to be defined, and this puts at risk little communities like Bulga, and there are plenty of Bulgars. We've seen the mining invasion, and in Queensland, Sini and Newman are full steam ahead. If you get in the way, doesn't matter. Don't worry about science. Don't worry about the precautionary principle. It doesn't exist. We'll run over the top of you. 40,000 coal seam gas wells on the Darling Downs. In the next 10 years, 10 open-cut coal mines. Wipe Ackland out of existence. It doesn't matter that you promised to protect Ackland before you were elected. That's irrelevant. The mining companies in this invasion say, well, we're going to be short of gas. You've got a loony as the Federal Education Minister McFarlane who says, get it out of the ground. And away they go to get it out of the ground. What to do with it? Export it. Who to? Foreign countries. Who's mining it? Foreign companies. Do they pay tax here? Who knows? Does anyone ask? No. As Rod McGeoch said in a wonderful interview I did with him in relation to the little Bulga people, what do they get from Rio Tinto when Rio Tinto bullies its way across these little communities? Rod McGeoch's wonderful expression, he said, Alan, they don't even get two and six. And as we've seen at Gloucester, these people get Gloucester going to Christmas time with their futures unresolved. There is, as I said, the Barry O'Farrell principle. And I said to him, well, would you like, with your wife and children, to live in a coal seam gas field? Would you like to live next to an open-cut coal mine? And if the answer's no, don't ask someone else to. If you don't want to live next to that, why should anyone else? You've got this fellow Napthine, the Premier of Victoria, a disgrace. His electorate is the electorate of the MacArthur Wind Farm, a dyed-in-the-wool disgrace. He thinks the wind turbines look nice. People are knocked over in all of this while politicians stand by, consistently, conspicuously, betraying the national interest and the well-being of the battlers and the strugglers, most of whom are just battling Australians, knocked over like pins in a bowling alley by greedy foreign interests. By the way, if you want to see what Gloucester's like, a bit of idle reading, there's a website, Rocky Hell it's called, because there's a big open-cut coal mine right on top of the town. Rocky Hell, H-E-L-L dot com. Spitting distance from the community in some of the finest land in the world. Rocky Hell dot com. I mentioned yesterday plans to build the world's largest offshore wind farm off the west coast of Britain are being scrapped. And we're told, quote, few investors are willing to stake the billions needed to build them, that's wind farms, in an environment where, quote, government subsidy is essential but uncertain. Here are all these people driving to work listening to me. Little business. They're going to open the shop. No subsidies to them. Why does the wind farm get subsidy when they're foreigners? We're talking about Holden. No more money. Qantas, no money. Why is there money for wind farms? Subsidies. Billions, not millions, billions. We've spoken to Albie Schultz and Angus Taylor and everyone. If you want to build a wind farm, go ahead, but with your own money, not taxpayers' money. Instead, Tony Abbott is facing all sorts of problems in Canberra, a twin problem where there is a commitment already made by the morons before him about renewable energy certificates, billions of dollars going to these proponents of wind farms. And they're not Australian. They're international outfits. Thailand is one of them. China's another. And Tony Abbott's got to unwind this. Particularly tough when you've got to bloke the energy minister, McFarlane, in bed with the wind industry, in bed with the coal seam gas industry. And here in New South Wales, the mining and wind invasion is continuing at breakneck speed. A listener wrote to me yesterday, Alan, is Canterbury a Labor Council? They'd be the only ones dumb enough, this is a listener, to in invest ratepayers' money in industrial wind turbines, knowing that the carbon tax and the renewable energy target are about to be axed. And you ask yourself, what? Canterbury Council are going to reach 30% of renewable energy by 2030? You, are you completely stupid out there? Who at Canterbury Council has done any homework at all? They're going to form an urban, rural, wind farm partnership. Canterbury Council, run by the Labor Party. The mayor's a bloke called Brian Robson. He says, your councillors are elected to represent you. Mr Robson, you are kidding. Is this the way ratepayers' money is to be spent? Nowhere do the local community wear this, and yet the stuff is everywhere. 
I've had a note from the Deputy Mayor of the Cooma Monero Council down there in the snow, snow area. They're fighting a wind farm to be built in the snowy mountains, the Boko Wind Farm, Nimitabel. Beautiful place, hundred farming country, 160 kilometres south of Canberra. It'll be developed by Eggco, Wind Prospect, General Electric. 43 turbines. Who are these people? Eggco, Thailand's biggest energy company. General Electric, the American multinational conglomerate. They're just laughing at us. They just see it come. they got dopes in Macquarie Street who give them the green flag. Wind Prospect, an international renewable energy company. This is part of the invasion. This outfit's got 20 offices in Europe, Africa and Asia. They're laughing at us. I said that on Anzac Day, an invasion. And it proves that Barry O'Farrell, Harch or Hazard, Hazard, they, well, Hazard, you are a Hazard. What is going on in the cabinet room in Macquarie Street? Michael West. Spoke to him last week, an outstanding journalist with the Sydney Morning Herald said, meanwhile, the gas producers aggressively push for coal seam gas to be expedited before the science and the prospective environmental damage have been done or properly thought through. And he highlighted the fact, remember, that the Environmental Protection Authority had produced a report on the Gloucester Basin. The report was hidden. And the Environmental Protection Authority reporting to the government what was being done at Gloucester by AGL with coal seam gas was threatening agricultural land and was high risk. But it's the same AGL that's building wind farms. The same vandals at Gloucester are at work now on wind farms. Michael West, a bright journalist with the Sydney Morning Herald, said when it comes to coal seam gas, proper process and accountability are elusive. Well, wind is the same. Friends of Collector, 63 turbines down near their Canberra, they had a meeting. Oh, no, don't worry with the O'Farrell government. Forget the science. Forget their views. Just approve the turbines. Who owns the show at Collector? Don't you love it? They call it Ratch Australia. Ratch Australia. Who are they? 80% owned by a major Thai power generating company. Barry O'Farrell said he'd return power to local government. Well, the local community at Collector are 99% opposed. They don't count. Then you've got the Gullen Range wind farm currently being constructed 20 kilometres west of Goulburn, 73 wind turbines, given approval by Harcher Hatch, in 2010. It'll begin operating next year. Who runs it? Oh, it's owned by a Chinese company called Gold Wind. They're laughing at us. Soft touch. Then you've got the Bowdoin Gora wind farm, approved by the O'Farrell government in August this year. None of this goes to ICAC. 40 wind turbines. This is out Mudgy, Wellington Way. They're going to build 250 at Ungulla, some as high as 194 metres, with a blade length of 65 metres. Who? Ratch Australia. Doesn't it look respectable? A Thai outfit. And it's happening in Queensland. Campbell Newman doesn't care. The Atherton Tableland. Who? Ratch Australia. Another Thai outfit. They call themselves Ratch Australia, but they're nothing, nothing Australian about these. Seven, I've got letters over and over again all this year from people living within 1.4, 2 kilometres of industrial wind turbines, dreadful sleep, dreadful symptoms, and international research that you couldn't jump over, proving the danger to health. Does Campbell Newman listen? Does O'Farrell listen? Does Napthine listen? Does Brad Hazard, Hadar, Hazard listen? 40 of these turbines near Wellington, 73 at Goulburn, 63 at Collector. Where are the people? Where are the people? Another one at Cooma Monero, Boko Wind Farm, 43 turbines. Then you've got Flyers Creek out near Orange. It's unbelievable. The New South Wales Department of Planning and Infrastructure have recommended approval for this thing. 20 non-hosts who don't want them are within two kilometres of the turbines and a local public school and two heritage villages and a nursing home and residents. And one resident wrote to me and said, what a blatant disregard for us. Where does this end? And then you've got these outfits peddling lies on the ABC because they're all wrapped up in their green ideology that there were no problems until someone came around and told people they should get sick. You've got two senior health officials in New South Wales, Dr Kerry Chant, the Chief Medical Officer, also the National Health and Medical Research Council, and a Professor Wayne Smith. Both should be sacked immediately. They've been saying there is not enough of a population impact to be worried. So ignore the problem. Then they're saying, and writing to the Planning Assessment Commission, telling them there is no proof that these things are injurious to health. Quote, New South Wales Health Advisors, 15th of March last year, that there is currently no health evidence to support a generic two-kilometre separation distance from a proposed wind turbine. 
If these people are health experts, they're a disgrace and they should hand in their badge. There's a stack of international evidence to disprove the advice that they're giving. In Falmouth in the United States of America recently, a judge in Massachusetts, 350 kilometres northeast of New York City, a judge ruled that two wind turbines caused, quote, irreparable physical and psychological harm to the health of neighbours. He ordered the turbines to be turned off immediately. Immediately. So there is Professor Wayne Smith betraying scholarship by peddling untruth. I spoke to Alan Watts, brilliantly credentialed, about the fraud of wind turbines. And he said the wind industry is based on greed, ignorance, subsidy and institutional deceit. He said it's propaganda towards the greedy, flatters the gullible and exploits the well-intentioned. He said the wind industry plunders our environment while enriching foreigners all under the guise of some mythical societal benefit. He said, they take our health, our land, our peace of mind and our taxes. We surrender our most precious mountains to this most gross industry. And in return, they give us social chaos, environmental destruction, lies, deceit, scorn and ill health. Three premiers of Australia, Newman, O'Farrell and Napthine, let all this go ahead. And in Canberra, the jury's out. Alan Watts, Dr. Alan Watts said to me last week, it represents not only poor science and wasteful economics, but is ignorance in defiance of truth and indifference to the welfare of Australian rural families. And as I've said, if they're not injurious to health, put them in Macquarie Street. Put them on Bondi Beach. Put them in Parramatta Road. Dr. Sarah Laurie is a former GP. She's fought like hell, all of this to the point of exhaustion. She's on the line. Sarah Laurie, good morning. Good morning, Alan. You have written to the South Australian Premier Jay Wetherill, asked him to hold a public inquiry into the conduct of the South Australian Environmental Protection Authority with respect to the monitoring of wind turbine noise and the inadequate wind farm noise guidelines. You've raised concerns about the conduct of this EPA because you've got a photo showing the location of the acoustic microphone was underneath a large gum tree. That's correct, Alan, and it wasn't the only one. There was another microphone at another location um, also set up by the EPA under a, a different set of trees, fir trees this time. It's just a staggering, isn't it? I mean, Look, it's fraud. It's fraud, but what's the agenda here? I mean, you've got Mary Morris. She was t- she took the photo. This poor woman. I've spoken to her. She's fought like hell. She's exhausted. They're living in this acoustic footprint of wind development. You've got Napthine as the Premier of Victoria. His electorate is the MacArthur Wind Farm. Yep. Look, it, it, it's not confined to one state, Alan. Um, as you, as you no. pointed out, it, it's... Uh, I mean, I know... I know residents who are impacted badly by Terrible. by noise in Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria and South Australia. You've got this American psychiatrist, Dr William Hallstein, giving a very eloquent short summary of what happens to people when they're severely sleep-deprived and describes what is happening to wind turbine noise affected residents, a residents affected by wind turbine noise as abuse. Yes, and it is. You've got the judge in at Falmouth, Massachusetts, saying, and I quote, he's talking about two wind turbines causing, quote, irreparable physical and psychological harm to the health of neighbours. He ordered the turbines be immediately turned off. Now, where is it? You've got people like Wayne Smith, a Professor Wayne Smith, Kerry Chan, Department of Health. These are professors telling lies to the Planning Assessment Commission. Look, Alan, I think it's extraordinary. Absolutely extraordinary. I mean, it, it, there is peer-reviewed published evidence showing that there is serious harm to human health because of sleep disturbance and impacts on mental health. Um, you know, perhaps there's a view that, that mental health problems are not health problems. I, I really... 1985, Dr Neil Kelly and his team of researchers in a three-year acoustic field survey in the United States of America found direct causation. By the way, at 7.30, I'll stay with Sarah Laurie. Direct causation of sleep disturbance and other symptoms from wind turbine. 1985. They've known this for ages and ages. That's correct, Alan. These results were presented to the American Wind Energy Association in 1987. No surprise there that the judge, therefore, in Massachusetts said, basically, 
ruled that two wind turbines caused irreparable physical and psychological harm to the health of neighbours. That's, that's correct, Alan. You've and got this Professor Wayne, Wayne Smith, Professor Australia. Wayne Smith denying, advising, and Dr Kerry Chant advising the Planning Assessment Commission here that there is no, quote, their words, there is no published scientific evidence to link wind turbines with adverse health effects. This is advice to the Planning Assessment Commission in New South Wales about 33 wind turbines near Wellington, and this is this Professor Wayne Smith, a letter signed by Dr Kerry Chant. There is no published scientific evidence. That is a lie. It's, uh, it's incorrect. Absolutely incorrect. Graham Lloyd, the environmental writer for the Australian, wrote in July, quote, health impacts caused by low frequency noise from wind turbines have been known to US researchers and the renewable energy industry for more than 25 years. Yep. Precisely. And, and Albie Schultz, did he not, in opposition, tried to get independent health and acoustic research done and he was blocked by the now energy minister, McFarlane. Yes, that's right, Alan. Dr Paul Schomer a PhD in electrical engineering acoustics from the University of Illinois, an American expert, presented a paper at the 5th International Conference on Wind Turbine Noise in Denver, Colorado, this year, 28th to the 30th of August. The paper entitled, A Proposed Theory to Explain Some Adverse Physiological Effects of the Infrasonic Emissions at Some Wind Farm Sites. And he argued that there was scientific literature of people being made ill by low frequency sound and infrasound. That's correct. It's Alan. everywhere, this stuff. Yes, there's more and more evidence. Yep. It's, it's being ignored, um, and it's being ignored in Australia by health, planning, and noise pollution regulatory authorities. Um, and even by. Why? Trump. Why? What's the agenda here? Why? Are well, these... I think I think there needs to be a full inquiry. And, it's and Royal Commission stuff. In South Australia. I mean, didn't a Senate inquiry recommend two years ago that we get wind turbine health research done in this country? And a precautionary principle would say until we can now verify what these American researchers and scientists are saying, there should be no approvals given. Look, we've been saying that for a while, Alan. We've said that there should not be approvals given to turbine development plus even 10 kilometres to people's homes. Because or, that's... if there is, put them on Bondi Beach. Well... Put them in Macquarie Street. What? Yeah. Well, there, look, there, there are clearly problems, and there have Quite. been for years. Dr Kerry Chant signed... This is the head of New South Wales Health. She signed a letter about wind farms to the Department of Planning and said, and you've heard everything that I've just read to you, quote, New South Wales Health advice is... There is currently no health evidence to support a generic two-kilometre separation distance from a proposed wind turbine. That is a lie. Look, it's, it, you're absolutely right. We do need more research. However, um, on the basis of the evidence that we have now and on the reports from people around Australia at existing wind developments, particularly the larger wind developments, um, there are serious reports of harm to health, particularly mm. from the cumulative impact of chronic severe sleep deprivation out to at least 10 kilometres and in some instances further. Um, these people are being harmed by, by noise pollution that we knew nearly 30 years ago was going to cause these problems. Absolutely. And it's, those frequencies are not being measured deliberately mm. Mm. in the noise guidelines. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a disgrace. It's a global problem. Um, and it's it's an appalling abuse of um, and it's, so, people, and, and it's an abuse yeah. of power by government. But subsidised by taxpayers. Yeah. Subsidised by taxpayers. Well, in effect, every electricity consumer who pays a bill, who's paying a proportion of their bill towards the renewable energy certificate, is subsidising abuse of country people. Correct. And driving them out of their homes. Correct, and, and if there was no abuse, okay, no abuse, we'll put them on Bondi Beach, put them in Macquarie Street, put them on Parramatta, had plenty of wind there, plenty of wind on Bondi Beach. Yeah. Why do they have to be at Goulburn? Why do they have to be at Blaney? Why do they have to be at Orange? Why do they have to be at Walbra, where you are? See, the thing, the reason I'm talking to you today on, uh, we've talked before on December 11, two weeks from Christmas. Now, I don't want to get maudlin or emotional or sentimental about this, but it's Christmas coming up. How do these people manage at this time of the year, every day, every night, facing the utter debasement of their quality of life. It's very difficult, Alan, and it's, it's, 
it's even more difficult when they know that more approvals have been um, rammed through and there are going to be more of their country folk um, who are being impacted. They know what it's like and they don't want to see anyone else suffer the way they are suffering. Amazing. You're a great lady, Sarah Laurie. Thank you for your time. I just... Well, to you and all the people that make contact with you and who are listening to us here, I hope you have a happy Christmas as happy as it is possible to have. But I suppose the only thing we can say, Sarah, we'll be back. We'll we be back. Indeed. The fight the is, is on. The problem is not going to go away. Alan. Not going to go people away. People are determined that um, things are going to change. Good on you. Good to talk to you. Thanks, Alan. Thank you. Here we are. There but for the grace of God, eh? It's unbelievable, isn't it? And that's what I said at the beginning. We're coming to the end of the year, and as we draw to the year, one conclusion is inescapable. Government in this country has been diabolical in its betrayal of those who have elected.